Paula Bennett, and I was born in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica, in the West Indies. I'm a triple prime girl, bookmarks in 7, 7, 11, 67. Uh, that's an interesting question because I'm a board certified family practice physician, went to medical school in Buffalo, New York. I actually, actually it started in 2016 where I felt that I was a little bit frustrated with medicine, just the structure of medicine. And I thought, I cannot do this anymore, battling with insurance companies for coverage. of, And so I decided to transition from preventive medicine to the ER. And so I was actually, as a locum tenens physician, which means that I travel from one place to another. So I was working between Minnesota and uh, emergency rooms in Nebraska, taking care of patients in rural hospitals, smaller rural hospitals that did not have full-time docs. So there is actually a doctor's house right next to the hospital. Uh -huh. But in the middle of winter in northern Minnesota, 20 miles from the Canadian border, I found that to be extremely laborious and trying and it raised my blood pressure. And I said, you know what, I'll just stay in the hospital. So every time I go up there now, they give me my own room in the hospital. <laughs> I started in uh, San Diego with the cruise ships that came in, that was the first phase of the pandemic. If you remember the cruise ship that was anchored off the coast of San Diego, and they had all those COVID patients that were, that were on board and at sea for two weeks before they were even allowed to come onto land and then they were transferred. I treated those patients that were either positive for COVID but developed no symptoms, or they had symptoms of COVID, but their tests came back consistently negative. There was an entire protocol for even going into the COVID zone, which was called the hot zone. You know, you had somebody who was, their only job was to ensure that you were properly attired you know, and dressed to go into this zone because you realize that if you were not, you would bring COVID out with you and infect everybody else. You know, you'd have somebody who would put your gown on and they'd zip you up and then they'd put your gloves on and then they'd tape around your gloves and then they'd put your mask on and your respirator on. You'd look just like you're going into, you know, like, a, like a, you're going into space. Or we would have to, you know, we, you would have the mask and you'd have the shield and they would discard the shields because there were so many of them. And then we began to realize that there was a shortage and then we had to start uh, sanitizing the shields. Patients were very scared and they had access to television and they had access to the news. Many of them would say to me, you know, I think this is the end of days, this is the plague, you know, this is of biblical proportion, you know, and others, you know, the ones who did not got very angry because they could not understand why they were being sequestered in these locations. After San Diego, I went to Texas and I worked in Laredo for two months. What happened in Laredo was the hospitals were overwhelmed. All of their ICUs and the floor beds were taken up by COVID patients, but COVID patients were taking a very long time to recuperate. And so patients that still required oxygen and you know inhaler treatments, they were all sent off-site to these acu ac acute care facilities outside of the hospital that were equipped with oxygen tanks and so forth and were staffed by doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and that's where I was. And I told you about the police officers and very often they'd be the one escorting patients into us. And one of them came in and he said to me, oh, you know, I have, I, I got COVID. And so he'd been off for a very long time re recovering from COVID and then had come back to work. And so, you know, he was telling me that his mother-in-law said, well, you know, you don't want to get COVID again, so you need to engage in these practices. Oh, no, no, she told me, he said, this is what the president says they take every, he takes this every day. So he showed me the drops and it was sodium chloride, which is salt water, ascorbic acid. Yes, one was ascorbic acid. The, the short of it was none of those regimens have been proven. I broke it down to him and I explained to him in great detail how the virus replicates and why these things likely wouldn't work and why the ACE inhibitors work. And he said to me, oh, I understand. Oh no, that makes sense. And then he said, well, you know, it's time to take my regimen that my aunt, that my mother-in-law said. <laughs> and I just, I just, I saw it and I thought, I don't understand this. This is so odd. So my name is Min Fang. I was born in Vinh Long, Vietnam. 
um, on July 20th, 2002. And I love cracking jokes with my um, family members. Uh, I'm currently um, a college student at the University of Omaha, Nebraska, and I currently work as a patient attendant at Nebraska Medicine. So I was um, actually a senior in high school, and I would just wake up in the morning, uh, get ready, and then I'd go to school. And then in the afternoon, I would attend my, um, I would attend mock trial, and then I'd go home, eat dinner, and then go to sleep. It was just a pretty uh, normal life. Like, my parents would go to work. My dad was working the morning shift, so he'll be home for us. Like, he'll be home in the afternoon, and then my mom did the night shift, so she'd get us ready in the morning. Like, she'd drive us to school and stuff. I was in the lunchroom with my friends, and we were just scrolling on Facebook, I think. And then I we just saw, like, the first outbreak of, like, COVID-19. And we were just like, <gasps> like, we just didn't really care about it. We were just like, oh, okay. And then we kept scrolling. Yeah, actually, uh, I talked about it with my friends. I was like, guys, like, I'm kind of scared about this new virus, you know? And they were just like... They kind of poked fun at it. If anything, they were like, are you sure you're not a carrier? You know what I mean? So I was just like, huh? Because we all know that it came from, like, it originated in China, or, like, the first case did. And so I was just kind of taken aback because my friends usually, like, don't joke like that. So I was just like, why did they say that? Oh, no. Like, they're thinking like that, and that's not good. And I was kind of hurt by it. And so I told them, I was just like, you know, that's not cool. Like, you shouldn't be saying that to me. One time I was in Walmart and um, I was just looking at like medicine, I think. And like a group of boys walked by me and they yelled, um, how does that bat taste? And I was in complete shock because I was just doing my normal daily thing like you know just looking browsing medicine and all of a sudden like i get that type of comment um towards me so i was just like you know i was like i became livid about like at them at like myself and like everybody yeah, yeah because there were people around me that heard me but they didn't say anything I used to like talk to the employees and we would ask them for help, but now I just use my phone and like search for things instead of like going up and asking people because I'm too afraid that like they might say something to me. Because um, at that time, I was like waiting on scholarships, like a scholarship to get back to me, and they told me that I got waitlisted. And so I didn't want to put like like, especially with COVID-19, I didn't want to put my family through, like, debt in case, like, you know, my parents were to fall ill. So mm -hmm. I just decided to not go to college. I worked, and it just felt like um, all my friends were, like, living, like, you know, their lives at college, they're having fun. But I just decided, like, stay at home. That was, it was kind of, like, my motivation as well because I wanted to go to college and learn about why do people act like this. And I just wanted to educate people, like get an education so that I can educate people. During 2020, when I got that envelope, it was like a pretty thin envelope and I didn't know what was inside. And then like, it told me, they told me like I was waitlisted. But like this envelope was different, it was like thicker. Yeah. I felt like it had more papers. <laughs> so I was just like, oh my goodness, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? And I waited until like, my dad and my sister came home to open it with them because I was just like, what if I got rejected again, you know? Mm -hmm. But then, like, when I opened it, like, I think I, I screamed really loudly. And my sister was like, whoa, you know? She's never <laughs> seen, like, so much expression from me. And, like, I just I started cheering up. It was, like, great because I felt like all my hard work and effort, mm -hmm. you know, like, enduring everything, like, it paid off. And, like, I started texting, like, all my family members, like, my mom, and then like she called me when, while she was on break at work and she's like, you know, congratulations, you know, you know, you're, you're so smart, like, I'm proud of you. Yes, my name is Anthony Lewis Warrior. I was born in Pawnee, Oklahoma, 
and it was 1976. Currently right now I'm an HR director for the Nebraska Indian Community College. I also uh, run my own uh, consultation business with uh, food sovereignty projects. 2019 I did decide to come back and uh, kind of brave the educational journey again. So that's kind of what I was doing in my, my typical day at the time was I had just left a major uh, casino as a chef and I was trying to make my way back into uh, casinos in another state and uh, I got kind of uh, pulled back towards the family ways. Uh, my, my wife and myself, uh, we were married for a year and then we ended up having our first child. And uh, taking a step out of the casino um, was a big change from being the workaholic then concentrating on a new daughter which I, I barely saw you know I barely saw her for the first year of her life and uh, kind of came to a standstill several realization that that's what she needed you know for that developmental years so the the staying point was seeing that my mother had you know she aged and seeing some of the struggles of maintaining a daily life on a farm uh, and just kind of being asked if uh, it would be any option for me to kind of stay around with my family and and I knew her intentions also was to keep my my wife and child grounded while I was trying to rule the world <laughs> and so she did a very fantastic job of painting a picture of, of uh, really needing my help and then I did get talked into from from my very loving wife that uh, you're too smart not to have a degree you know and so looking back into the educational process was just another um, reason for me to kind of keep my feet grounded so that I could have something to show my, my, child, my child at the time, you know. So right before that, really saying we're going to be heading to Washington State to go interview for a chef position. And I had already been informed to come up there and to do it, and I just needed to set the date. So that couple weeks of really sitting still um, I was ready to jump and just go even if my wife and child uh, was going to stay there with my mother while I went and did this adventure and then right at that probably about the, the one month period uh, my wife revealed to me that during the year that I was working with with the child uh, of us just being married and, and bring a child up and me leaving before she's awake and coming home when she was already asleep. She revealed to me that, you know, she was she thought about leaving me within that time. And that's another mark where you say, I'm not going to fail because that's not what I do. So that that would have been one of the most dramatic turning points for me during that time of figuring out what uh what I needed to do. There are people who care for you and they're constantly worried about you and then looking over at your you know your one-year-old daughter and saying you know listen you, you've got to make more time for this person you've got to be there because you you don't need to be the absent father and the other part about being kind of cooped was staying busy I had to constantly and it drove him crazy because I just, uh, I won't say picking fights, but just picking at somebody. <laughs> why is this here? Why is that there? You know, and <laughs> how come is this is over here? Why, you know, why are we disorganized? Uh, why do we got so much stuff? You know, and <laughs> my mother kept saying, you leave them alone. You leave us alone. <laughs> I'd go downstairs and go, oh, just breathe. <laughs> um but on the, on the other side, uh, one thing that keeps me sane in today's world is I'm a, actually do catering. I still cater quite a bit. That's my passion. That's my drive. Um, the HR work is the psychological side. That's the part that I um, I value uh, in being worth, have that self worth. But if, if honestly, if I had to quit catering, you know, cold turkey, uh, it, I'd probably be having the twitches, and <laughs> my 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 family would be probably more miserable with me around. <laughs> And I'm still a workaholic, um, but I've, I'm learning that balance a lot better than uh, mm -hmm. when I did. And uh, honestly, every time uh, I used to cater, it was for my own glory. You know, it was, it was for my uh, worth. But now, every time I pick up a gig, I'm excited to do it because that adds to my family. So I'm Father David Escliano. I was born in 
southeast Mexico, a town uh, called Chelumal, which is on the border with Belize. I'm the rector of the cathedral church. I'm also the pastor of the cathedral parish. So parish is a group of people, uh, usually around a church, but we have, we, we have different ethnicities. We have masses in English, Spanish, uh, Vietnamese, and Latin. I started my assignment in July of 2019. Um, I was coming back from Rome, where I was finishing a degree uh, in church law. And it was just learning the parish. Uh, every time you, you get a new assignment, a new parish, it takes at least a year to learn uh, what's going on, to get to know the parish. So it was mid-March. That's when we started hearing about it more, because that was, I think, the first cases coming to the States. And I go every other month to meet with a priest in uh, Northern Missouri, Conception Abbey. He's an, a monk, and he's my spiritual director. He's kind of like an, a, a counselor, or advisor I see every, every other month. And on the way there, there were already rumors about, uh, or, or more than rumors, we we're getting information from our diocese. Just, this is coming up, just so you're aware, uh, this is happening. But I do remember, uh, because it was um, right before uh, St. Patrick's. So I was driving back from, from Conception, I think it was a Friday. And right before I left, I emailed my staff here. And it's a very small staff, and just asking, for their input and just saying, okay, we need to be prepared. We may need to cancel uh, classes for a little bit. Um, so how are we gonna handle that? And that was just because of the communications we had received. Um, the idea of canceling masses wasn't even like coming to my mind, just canceling classes. A couple of my staff members replied right away like, oh, no, 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 this will never happen. We've been through that before. It would just be getting hand sanitizers, and, and that's it. That, that's as bad as it's going to be. Yeah. Um, like, well, we don't know. So by the time I made it to town, that's a four-hour uh, long drive, we had already received notice that everything was canceled. There is nothing more important than the Mass for us. Our documents, our church documents, says, say that that's the source and summit of our lives. So the idea of canceling Masses who had never crossed my mind. In, in our case, we, we, in our house, which is just across the street next to the cathedral, we have a private chapel, which we use for uh, prayer. We have four priests living in, in the house, so we got every morning for prayer. So we were doing our masses there, but with nobody else. It was more shocking when we had masses at the cathedral because then Easter came up, that was uh, during Lent, so Easter came up, that was shocking. Having a mass in the cathedral where, with, with nobody there. The mass, that our mass is a dialogue. It has a dialogue part. And there are parts where you would say, the Lord be with you, and there is nobody to reply. Everything was different. Uh, eventually we started recording using a cell phone or, or streaming using a cell phone. But even that, just looking at a cell phone, we were created for community. Just today at Mass, uh, the reading is the creation of, um, of Eve. And the line is, man was not created to be, or was not meant to be alone. And suddenly we are all isolated. We asked people, show us that you are participating. And they started taking pictures of themselves watching us at Mass. So, so, so I received pictures of families around their TV with us on, on TV because they were watching Mass or a small computer or a cell phone. And, and at least that was, there was that virtual connection, but it wasn't the same. Holly Meese. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, um, 1960. 2019, I was still uh, working full-time at the hospital that I worked at, and um, my husband also was, was working um, as well, and we were uh, empty nesters, so uh, we, you know, uh, enjoyed the things going on in Sioux City. 
I think things started to change maybe in the middle of the beginning of spring, middle spring type uh, in 2020. Um, we started having to wear masks and um, we saw more and more patients coming in with COVID. Uh, we had to designate a certain floor for COVID patients. Then things really started to um, unravel, uh, I would say, um, probably probably in the middle of April. Um, we had a couple kids that were graduating. My oldest son was graduating from law school, and my youngest daughter was graduating from undergrad at Loyola, uh, Chicago, and we had to cancel all those plans uh, for their graduations. And I had had a week at the end of April and the first week in May taken off for those. And um, I stopped off at work uh, shortly before that to pick up something in my locker. And I walked into what I would consider a MASH episode. Our whole department had turned into um, an ICU because uh, ICU could not accommodate all the COVID patients, so they were spilling into my department. I worked in a phase one post-anesthesia care unit. Then I felt very guilty and called my manager and asked if there was um, anything I could do to help out, and apparently um, one of our nurses uh, that works the night shift had taken a leave of absence, and she said, I have a um, a week of 12-hour night shifts, <laughs> which I've worked nights for 30 years. So, um, but I, I committed to it um, only to realize that um, the, these were patients that um, were um, a little bit beyond what we were used to taking care of. Um, uh, my second assignment, they were going to give me three intensive care patients to take care of, and I, I just told them that that wasn't safe. That's pretty much what our department turned into was an intensive care unit. I also remember that's the time I got an app on my phone for Starbucks <laughs> because <laughs> I needed a little food therapy and I would my routine would be to drive through Starbucks and, and get a coffee, uh, realizing that that's really the only thing that I was able to drink or eat during the whole day. I was, my anxiety was so bad that I just, I couldn't even eat. Of course, we didn't get breaks anyway. So I do remember a terrible, terrible shift one time. Um, I had a uh, intubated patient in one room, and uh, I had another patient that I was weaning off a medication drip. And I felt so bad because time had gotten away from me that um, I totally missed ordering dinner for him. I asked him, where can I get some dinner for you? And he said, well, I really like townhouse. So I said, let me order you some dinner. But I, I felt a lot of times coming home from work very deflated. Um, it was unsafe. I didn't feel like I was able to um, give the patients the care and the time that they needed. Um, I started losing weight. I started just having impending doom when I woke up in the morning, realizing that I had to go to work to do this. And I told my manager, I, I felt like I just had to take a leave of absence. I just felt very disappointed and unsupported. Um, I, they did not honor my short-term disability. And um, I do remember reading an article in the paper about our leadership feeling that at no point nurses were overwhelmed with the work that they had. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a time when nurses were being celebrated as heroes, but I felt very short-changed and um, unsupported by my own leadership. I do remember just going out for more walks and taking advantage of being outdoors and just really appreciating nature more and just the area that we lived in. And, and one, one day, um, I just, I just ended up driving to Okaboji for breakfast. <laughs> My name is Patia Adam. I was born originally from Ethiopia, so I was born in Ethiopia. I was born in 1988. I work for Luton Service in Iowa um, as a case manager or case worker for refugee and immigrant service here in Sioux City. But, and you weren't at Lutheran Services at that time? No, I was with 
the Mary Australia community house. I love that place. <laughs> yeah. I wake up every day excited to get to work. You know, as Mary Australia is open to the community and you don't know who you help and who you see every day, just go there surprise helping people, anybody who walk in and you know. I heard on the news of course are and then what I work at also we start getting calls from schools. Ooh, yes, uh, the only issue probably that kids don't understand why they're not gonna go out or why um, they're not going to school every day or how come we don't go out to play or go take them to the park. Like why everything, like why we don't go to school anymore? Why my teacher say this? Why just like not understanding the whole virus thing, how it passed through. And then the more explaining is just that now they're actually afraid to go. They just think they're gonna die or something. So it's a little bit scary in a way. And then also, if you're a working parent, you're afraid to go to work because you don't know. Your kids are home now from school to be safe, but you go out, still you have to work. So you don't know what you bring in to your kids. Also, that's another extra hard to yeah. manage every day. Like, walk in the door, make sure you don't touch the kids before, you know, when they're running to you. Your kids don't understand you, but you have to push them away until you change from this clothes and wash your hand. And For my husband, I mean, he has to actually of afraid of the pandemic and he doesn't know what to bring home to the kids, so he has to quit his job. He worked at Tyson, so that's when the, a lot of um, virus is spread a lot. And Tyson, a lot happened every day. People get home and sick. So he have to decide, like, choose job or his family, and then he have to quit a job. So he was home, in a way, make a little bit easier so I can go to work. He can be home with the kids. But again, when you have this big family, you need two people to work in the household in order to manage. It's hard and, like, you know, you still, the life still goes on. You still have bills to pay. You still have things to worry. But I, it won't, it doesn't cost between us, understand why he did what he did. It's for, it's for safety of our kids. It's just that then one of us have to work more hour and more, like we have to choose him to not work and I work more because with my job it's way easier to protect myself from the pandemic than his job. Even though I would say his job the one makes or bring more money in. It's pandemic and so I'm a, I'm a wife and I understand that everybody's different so I understand the situation I manage. In a way I'll think one thing pandemic is brought kids together and brought a family together. Yes, um, it changed one for this place with like Mary Australia as we help it's open to everybody, but a lot of time, a lot of clients that comes here, those people who doesn't speak the language or, you know, they need help, don't even understand about this pandemic, um, how it's spreading, how it's easy to spread and what they need to do to protect themselves. They don't have um, access to their language, explain more detail. You know, some people don't even know how to pay their bill. We just tell them where or how. It's just that simple thing to them. It's just like, it's a big thing. So when they have the pandemic because of pandemic everything closed down they just feel like they they will lose their family they will lose their job they will just they don't know where to go to get for help they just it's hard because i'm always there in the community helping them here in their situation figure a way to help them and ease their days but when you have no answer you don't know how to help you don't it's hard even it's hard on me to like i don't have answers for them Support for Facing a Changed World, an oral history of the COVID-19 pandemic, comes from the Margaret Ann Martin Everest Foundation, the Kind World Foundation, Humanities Iowa, the Friends of Siouxland Public Media, and listeners like you.